guys, welcome to Insights, where we talk to experts around the globe about mental health issues. Today, we have a very special guest, who is uh, Dr. Richard Gewirtz. Dr. Gewirtz is a distinguished professor of psychology at the California School of Professional Psychology at Alliant International University in San Diego. He has been involved in research and clinical work in applied psychophysiology and biofeedback for the last 30 years and was the president of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback in 2006 and 2007. His primary research interests are in understanding the physiological and psychological mediators involved in disorders such as chronic muscle pain, uh, fibromyalgia, and gastrointestinal pain. In this vein, he has studied applications of heart rate variability via feedback for anxiety, pain, gastrointestinal, cardiac rehabilitation, and other disorders. He is the author of many journal articles and chapters on these topics. He also manta maintains a part-time clinical practice treating patients with anxiety and stress-related disorders. Well, welcome, Dr. Gavritz, and thank you very much for accepting to doing this interview. How are you? Good, good. Good to be here. So, uh, Dr. Gavritz, uh, what can you tell us about HRV biofeedback as a, as a treatment for, for several of these disorders that we mentioned? Well, many years ago, we <clears throat> we were interested in mind-body connections, especially in Eastern philosophy. And so we started studying yogis and swamis and Eastern meditators and measuring them physiologically. And we noticed that most of them used a very specific technique, although there were a variety of techniques, most of them used a specific technique. And when we measured their physiology, we saw remarkable changes. Um, so ordinarily, if you're measuring heart rate beat by beat, you see some waves, wave forms that go with breathing. And the way it works is the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, goes into a, a, it's a break, it's a vagal break, and it goes into withdrawal during inhalation and goes on during exhalation. So if you're looking at heart rate beat by beat, you see a complex pattern of waveforms that's coming from the, the vagus nerve making adjustments. When we started measuring these swamis, we saw that small waveform go into massive big sine wave forms. So heart rates would, instead of going from, let's say 65 to 72 beats a minute, would go from 61 to 90 beats a minute in each breath cycle. And it was very remarkable, very dramatic. And we didn't really understand why that was, but we started, uh, this is with my colleague, Paul Lehrer at Rutgers. We started doing the biofeedback because it seemed like it was a match to Eastern philosophy things. And, and we quickly realized that it was a powerful technique. After that, another researcher, a Russian researcher named Evgeny Vashilo, uh, Paul met him in Russia and eventually came over here. And he started studying the phenomena and, and began to help us understand physiologically and from an engineering point of view exactly what was happening. And so during and so the, the biofeedback technique is different from the measurement. It's developed out of these out of this background. So when people breathe at a very slow rate, somewhere around five, six, seven breaths a minute. Uh, and it's unique to each person, they're, they're training the oscillations in their heart rate at a very specific rate. But there's another oscillator in the body called blood pressure, it comes through the baroreceptors, the, the blood pressure sensors. <clears throat> and blood pressure has its own rhythm in the body at somewhere around six per minute, five, six, seven per minute. So when you get the two rhythms lined up exactly right, you get something in physics that's called resonance two oscillators that are that are triggering each other just like you would get in a swing yeah swinging back and forth so 
in a swing, you would see one oscillator doing that. But if the both sides are being pushed, then you get way bigger swinging. And right. we realized that what was happening during the biofeedback was people were learning to optimize the rate of breathing with sort of a mindful mindset that produced the greatest oscillations in their heart rate. And at the time we weren't sure why that would be beneficial, but it really seemed to be beneficial to people with anxiety, depression, and many physical disorders. Uh, so we assumed that we were improving and then quickly we discovered that this training, if you do this on a regular basis, that you train the baroreflex, the, the ability of the blood pressure to affect heart rate gets trained up pretty quickly within about three or four weeks of daily practice. Okay. And this, this measure was not thought to be changeable. That people thought it was an immutable reflex in the body. In fact, the cardiologist working with us didn't believe it until we actually showed it to him. But once we realized, well, we are really changing the neuroplasticity of the system by training up the bare reflex, we then began to study what happens in terms of the vagal afferent pathways, the pathways going from the body to the brain and now we have a whole bunch of new research showing that the, now those pathways are greatly affected by this specifically slow breathing rhythm. Again, that's why it's probably been around for 2,500 years. The body is really responding to these very powerful waveforms that affect both the body and the brain. And that's how we kind of developed little by little the technique for using heart rate variability biofeedback. It's pretty easy kind of biofeedback to learn. Uh, you don't actually need extremely expensive equipment to do it, uh, but it's helpful to have some equipment to be able to help find the exact right frequency. Yeah. So uh, by, by training this or by having people train this particular breathing rate, they are actually training their barrel reflect barrel reflex as well yeah. and and by doing this uh, in this resonant frequency they can have an impact over uh, their brain health and other aspects of their physical health yes so pretty much any any condition in the body that's regulated by the autonomic nervous system is improved by this technique So it doesn't, of course, if it's not regulated by the autonomic nervous system, it may be effective for other reasons, but not as powerful. So for instance, the, the whole gastrointestinal system is heavily regulated by the autonomic nervous system. So when you teach people this technique, it re-regulates their gastrointestinal system if it's, if it's been affected by anxiety or stress or something like that. Um, similarly, the, uh, the way most, most kinds of chronic muscle pain are regulated by an overreaction of the sympathetic nervous system, but the parasympathetic nervous system controls that. So when you strengthen the system, it dampens the input from the sympathetic into trigger points in muscles. Mm -hmm. So for chronic pain, we get really dramatic relief from chronic pain by using the technique. And then in addition to that, The pathways from the body to the brain, the afferent pathways are called, seem to be in line with what we're seeing from research in vagal nerve stimulators, or their devices that are implanted that relieve epilepsy, epileptic seizures, as well as anxiety. So we now have some reason to believe that this technique is also quite effective for depression and anxiety. Uh, in a way that the stimulator might be, but without the stimulation, without without an invasive device. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like learning to stimulate the vagus nerve then uh, by means of self-regulation. Right. Hey, I think that most people find the concept of heart rate variability rather counterintuitive because I think people tend to think that when they hear that a, a heart beats an average at 60 beats per minute, they, they might think that the heart must uh, beat in a steady rhythm, right? right. So, 
So so yeah, here's the analogy that I use for that. Imagine that you're steering a boat across a, a body of water with currents, right? And and the tiller that you steer with is an, an analogous to the heart rate. The, the course of the boat is like blood pressure. So what the body is trying to do is to st stabilize blood pressure but to do it, it has to use a lot of effort in heart rate. So if you were if you were looking at the tiller, you'd be doing a lot of steering, but the boat would be going straight because you're compensating for the current and the wind, right? Yeah. And the variability in the tiller is similar to variability in heart rate. The reason variability is good in heart rate is because it means your heart rate, your autonomic nervous system is making adjustments for all kinds of external and internal phenomena. So the gut is making demands on you, the brain is making demands on you, as well as external stresses and threats and temperature. And the autonomic nervous system's job is to keep everything stable. But to do that, it has to move heart rate around quite a lot. So variability in heart rate is good. Variability in blood pressure is not good. So we're getting, we're paying the price for variability in other physiological systems by having variability in heart rate. Yeah, it's it's then the the as you mentioned in, in this analogy, like the driver towards a a steady state in 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 blood pressure, right? Right. Right. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, at the beginning of of your research you started seeing that training heart rate variability had beneficial effects, but you weren't uh, sure why. Uh, after after so many years of, of research, what can you tell us about how this training affects our brain? Well, the first thing we found out was that it affects barrel, barrel reflex. So we kind of got to that pretty quickly. But that didn't explain why it would have it, it reduced anxiety and depression. So the next series of research was to try to figure out what's happening in the brain during this kind of technique. So um, our group has done some, done two published studies. Dr. Lair's group has done a couple. Dr. Vishilo did, did a, a number of studies. And recently there's a study at the University of Southern California, a very elaborate an expensive study that saw what happened in a resting fMRI state when people do this kind of biofeedback. And what they found is that the emotional, the resting state affect regulation component of the brain, which is pretty much the component between the amygdala and the left prefrontal cortex, is greatly strengthened by this biofeedback and not by a placebo procedure. So it looks like that those vagal afferents are, are rewiring the brain in a way to help stabilize emotion regulation or inhibitory circuits that keep us from being out of control emotionally. Uh, and so we at least have those two mechanisms. And the other mechanisms are more psychological, uh, self-efficacy, perception of self-control, those are kind of obvious, but um, it's pretty neat when you get to see your own physiology on the screen and control it, it makes people feel good about themselves. They feel like, oh, I have control of something that I didn't have before. So there are also psychological factors. And then the fourth factor we don't know yet, but it looks like whatever else is going on might be strengthening your ability to be mindful, ability to be uh, non-judgmentally um, uh, uh, to look at look at the world from a non-judgmental, open minded, open hearted manner, maybe. We don't know much about that yet. But my experience clinically is that people even who are not very open to mindfulness, when they do this biofeedback, they kind of start getting the idea of mindfulness a little bit better. So that, that, that remains to be seen. That's the future research, but it, it could be that that's also what's happening. Okay, so it appears that people that are uh, getting some sense of proficiency in in heart rate variability or in training heart rate variability might also have uh, 
less difficulty in learning mindfulness meditation or mindfulness exercises. Yeah, that's that's our speculation. We don't have really good data on that yet. Okay, but it definitely seems worth checking out yeah. or, or looking into. Okay, in, in several uh, articles or published works, uh, I have been coming into the, the, the concept of frontal vagal network, which I, I believe it has something to do with what you just told us about how, uh, how frontal activity might be altered by, by this training. What do we know so far about it and its role on disease? Well, the first part of it we know quite a lot about, which is the, they call the CAN, the Central Autonomic Network. This is the, the, the work of Julian Thayer, Richard Lane, and to some degree, Steve Porges as well. So that has nothing to do with about feedback yet. That just has to do with understanding how the frontal areas of the brain and the, and the body are connected and how they reflect one another. And Julian has shown very elaborately that heart rate variability is a very good index. Resting heart rate variability is a very good index of what's going on in these frontal structures. He's got fMRI studies, all kinds of studies that show that. Uh, the newer part of it is seeing what happens during the biofeedback, and that's what I was just describing. So we now, we have preliminary data that those frontal structures, as well as other structures too, the, the, in one study, the cerebellum actually looked like it was the most responsive part of the brain to the to uh, slow breathing, to, to you know, resonance frequency breathing. So it may be that that explained like performance enhancement. We see a lot of performance enhancement with this technique in gymnasts and golfers and baseball players, um, techniques like that. It, it may explain why, partially why that's true. Um, so we don't know exactly yet what the effect of the treatment is on those things, but they, as I've described, the early research is very promising that it has a positive effect on those structures in the brain as well as maybe some other structures that we don't even know about yet. Okay. No, uh, it seems like a very promising tool and not only promising, but there's actually already a lot of evidence regarding different aspects and not only disease, but also performance enhancement and emotion regulation, et cetera, right? Right, right. So there's a number, there's a couple of meta-analyses out there that examined a number of studies together, came up with pretty positive results for the technique in terms of anxiety, depression, uh, stress reduction. Yeah. And there's a little bit, the data on performance enhancement probably isn't as elaborate, but all the studies so far have been positive. Hey, and you mentioned that, well, every people has its individual uh, breathing rate uh, that will maximize this oscillations but if, if someone uh, from the audience does not have access to to the equipment needed to to find out their individual frequency is it a safe bet to recommend and uh, breathing pacer and start breathing around six breaths per minute for example yeah so you, you're, you're gonna definitely get some benefits somewhere between four and a half and seven breaths a minute so if they just use a pacer, one of these free pacers on their phones, there's a whole bunch of them, and try a couple of different paces around six to start with five and a half, six, seven, see where they're comfortable. Eventually it'll feel right. If they do enough, they practice at that pace, they'll probably feel right. Uh, they may not get it exactly right, but they'll be close enough to be benefit from it. But there are cheap devices out now that they could use, I don't know, if it would be cheap on Mexican standards, but maybe. This is one called the Keto sensor, which is just a little air clip and it downloads to a uh, to some free apps on your phone. And you can get heart rate patterns on your phone and you can kind of experiment a little bit with that and see if you can come up with the right pace that way. But you're right, I think if you just started around six and tried five and a half, tried tried six and a half. If you're uncomfortable or if you get lightheaded, you should go faster. 
Sometimes people hyperventilate when they try this and it makes them feel not good. So if you're hyperventilating, you need to start at a little faster pace and slowly work your way to somewhere down where, where your frequency is. But most people are between five and a half and seven. So if you try those, you probably would benefit. Okay. And you mentioned that uh, benefits are noticeable after three to four weeks of, of training or practicing. What is the, the recommended time for for this practice or for, or for this training? Well, we recommend 20 minutes a day, but we realistically think that 10 minutes a day might be enough. Okay. Uh, most people don't find 20 minutes a day to do this easy to do, but most everybody can find 10 minutes a day. So if you can do a, a couple of 10 minutes a day, that's better. We don't really know what the magic dose is, but it, from our clinical experience, it looks like you need about 10 minutes a day to really get some benefits. Hey, maybe if a person is not does not find uh, the time to do 20 minutes straight, maybe if they divide it into two periods of 10 minutes and 10 minutes, maybe morning and evening, they would definitely benefit from this. Right, right. And a lot of people will do 10 minutes and then they'll try it right before bed, but it usually puts them right to sleep. Mm -hmm. So they don't get 10 minutes during the night, but it's a good way to go to sleep as well. Okay. And we have, we have music also free on our website. We have music, should I put it in the chat? Uh, we have a website where for our clinic, mm -hmm. um, which is HTTPS. So if you go to that site, then that's our clinic website. And then under the services, there's a pull down menu for breath pacer. And there's music that you can breathe to at every pace. Okay. So it starts at four and a half, five, five and a half, six, six and a half, seven, seven and a half, eight even. And you put the music on and it goes about 10 minutes and the music goes up, you breathe in. When the music goes down, you breathe out. For some people that really helps because they can put it on their phone or their iPad, uh, iPod and uh, do the practice like while they're waiting for the bus or Uh, sitting around in a waiting room or something and, uh, and uh, so for if you if you can do that or you can use the pain the visual pacers yeah it, all those work really well okay yeah and definitely the the music uh and and being able to to download it uh makes it more accessible and maybe to find the time between uh Oh, I don't know how 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 you say this, but between engagements, yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be any, like if we're doing with kids, they can do it on the bus on the way to school or in the car on the way to school or just any time that they have free time. Now, is there any counter indication for, for HRV training? Uh, there's only, Uh, only a couple. One is that some people hyperventilate when they first try it. So you want to emphasize slow breathing, not deep breathing. If they breathe yeah. too deeply, they blow off too much CO2 and they get lightheaded. So you want to be careful of that. If at any point you feel lightheaded or dizzy or uncomfortable, then you should stop and try going at a faster rate for a while until you feel comfortable. Some people do have an initial response where they kind of a relaxation anxiety where they mm -hmm. as soon as they feel relaxed they feel a little anxious usually that goes away with a little bit more practice it's not very common otherwise there's really no other counterindications even if you have atrial fibrillation or some other problem it won't hurt you you may have a hard time seeing the pattern in the biofeedback but you can still use the technique for okay. almost any condition Hey, perfect. And so th there is no different way of doing it among different con conditions? Uh, no, for you mean different medical conditions? Yeah. No, the, the basic technique is the technique and then we have to apply it in various ways to different conditions. Okay. What, what, what would be an indicator to, to a person that he is 
benef- uh, or starting to have a benefit out of this practice? Well, usually people within a few days feel very relaxed mm-hmm. and calm when they do it. Uh, and then it depends on what they're doing it for. They may notice that they're managing stress a little bit better. They may notice they're sleeping a little bit better. If they have specific symptoms, like especially gastrointestinal symptoms, they should notice those getting better fairly quickly. Um, if they're doing if they're doing it with pain, they should notice, like let's say they have uh, muscle pain, when they get a massage, and they do the technique with the massage, they'll notice the relief from the massage will last way longer. Hey. So instead of being just a few minutes until the massage is over and the pain comes back, they'll notice days of relief. So those are the most dramatic things that they'll see. And then we talked about the other mental ones. They may feel less depressed. They may feel less anxious. Um, those are the things we usually see. Uh, a common question I get from my clients is if the goal is to start breathing at this rate for the whole day. So just like exercising is very good for you for 30 minutes a day, it's not good for you to do it all day, right? It's very, very analogous. So if you, you know, we're, in fact, we're even now discovering that uh, marathon runners are not getting good health benefits from that. It's too much. Okay. So just like when you work out at the gym and you do 20, 30 minutes of workout, during that time, your physiology looks terrible. Right? It's, it's all over the place. Your heart rate's high, your muscles are tight, but then everything gets strengthened when you're not doing it. And yes. that's very, very much what happens here. You, 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 the goal is not to do this all the time, just to do it uh, either for that period of 10 minutes a day or do it when, when you're in a situation where you need it. So most of our clients will tell us that they then use it like if they have stage fright or public speaking fear or a medical procedure that they're that there's painful they'll use their breathing during those things as well but otherwise they're breathing normally the rest of the time okay so the the recommendation is to to practice this about 20 minutes a day if possible and then just uh if something happens for example if they're feeling anxious or if they're feeling uh, maybe with some Uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptom uh, at some point then they can use it at that moment but it's not the the objective to to start breathing every day every time at that rate correct excellent dr uh, gervitz uh, how can how can other professionals uh maybe physiotherapists or nutritionists Uh, use this knowledge and incorporate it into their own practice? Uh, well, a physiotherapist or occupational therapist can do it for sure by just even just making sure the person is learning this breathing technique while they're working on them and before and after they're working on them. It really do- definitely enhances the effects of depending what they're doing, but for pain especially. Now, But even even something like rehabbing a, a knee after knee surgery, uh, the patients find it useful to be able to do it during the painful rehab. So it's not the same, but it's still useful. So um, they can do it. They could put the, the like the physios could put um, music on that music I told you about for yeah. the person, have them breathe while they're working on them. They can they can kind of do that kind of stuff. I don't know about nutritionists, except just to encourage people to do the breathing every day. So. Yeah, yeah, but it sounds uh, that sounds like a very uh, feasible uh, method to to just play the music while they're getting their 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 therapy, or maybe in the waiting room, so people can start doing it before they go to their uh, massage or whatever kind of, of therapy they, they engage in. Right, right. And how about in, in conjunction with psychotherapy? Because I'm thinking that maybe even psychologists could play this music as well in their, in their waiting rooms, for example. 
Well, um, yeah, they could, but generally uh, we, in our clinic, we do both psychotherapy and biofeedback together. So we always start with the biofeedback and teach them the techniques. And then we use it in various ways, depending on what the person's problems are. But we find it a very helpful tool together with especially mindfulness-based psychotherapies. Okay. So it's probably not as useful for insight level therapies, but for, for mindfulness type therapies or for CBT even, this is a very useful tool to combine with, with the uh, therapy itself. Uh, even things like phobias. So we'll use the technique to calm the person down and then expose them to whatever the phobic thing is, let's say public speaking, mm -hmm. and then use the technique to calm down after they're or uh, anxious from speaking, and we go through it again and again and again and again until their fears lower down. Yeah. So that's our, our, our clinic mainly, that's what we do. We use a, a kind of a therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, together with biofeedback with pretty much everybody. Hey, and I'm sure that there, that there might be some kind of an additive effect uh, Dr. Pepper was was telling me about how uh, posture can influence the the cognitive behavioral component of therapy. So so I'm guessing that HRV might might have a a pretty important influence as well. Yeah, that's that's what we think. That's what we think. Okay. Uh, well, Dr. Gervitz, and I'm very thankful for having for you having taken time out of your schedule to talk a little bit about HRV with us. Okay, glad to do it. I'm sure I'm sure the the audience will be very interested and, and hopefully they will be curious enough to to look into HRV more in depth and learn about the ways it is measured and how it can benefit both themselves uh, maybe and if there are clinicians hearing us how they can implement it in their own clinical practice right right well thanks again and okay uh, hasta la vista <laughs> bye see you later